Just like the APC did during its national convention to select the party's chairman in the form of a consensus, there are indications that the presidential primary, which is less than four days away, might just take on the same form. On Tuesday, during the APC governor's, uh, governor's meeting with President Buhari, he announced that uh, he would love to pick his successor. Although the consensus might be a desirable uh, political option because of its capacity to reduce rancor, uh, divisiveness which uh, the contest might bring, it also sends a mixed signal if that decision would be in the interest of a few within the party. Joining us now via Zoom is the youngest APC presidential aspirant, Dr. Nicholas Felix. It's nice to have you, Dr. Felix. Uh, good morning. Nice to be here. Good Thank morning. Thank you for having me. Great. Yeah, Dr. Felix, this is Sam Omashe. Now, I want to, I want to know would you guys who are the presidential candidates really agree to any form of consensus? Yes, uh, like I've always said, I am not against consensus, especially since I know it's going to be favoring me. I'm the youngest candidate. I'm the new face that Nigerians are looking for. And uh, if it's... Uh, the party constitution permits it. I'm okay with it. But I've always said I have to know if I'm not the one who and why. So it's just be it's, it's beyond just a great or a concession. For me, it, it, a lot has to be put in place. A lot has to be said. I have to have a conversation with whoever before I will go for a concession. But I'm not against uh, concession. You know what? It's a, it is it is great. Consensus is a great thing. If it is Felix, if it's not Felix, it is not consensus. No, if it's not Felix, it, there can still be consensus. But I have to know that uh, whoever the candidate is going to be uh, buys the idea what I'm bringing on board, what I'm bringing to the table. If I'm going to step down for you and support you, I have to know that you're going to work on security heavily because that's my number one agenda. I have to know that Nigeria will be safe. I have to know there are things you're going to start doing immediately you are elected as president. So for me, it's beyond just agreeing to a consensus. Again, I'm not against it. And I want to believe that uh, whoever the, the person will be will, you know, will listen and uh, uh, follow suit. It doesn't believe, sorry, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to me that you think you are the best of the candidates if you are thinking of conceding to anybody. So why are you in the race? Of, I'm in the race because uh, I know I'm the best. I know I'm bringing a lot more than if you have listened to some of my interviews and some of the things that we've been doing. The ideas I'm bringing on board, none of these candidates uh, on, from both parties have them. And there are things that I know is going to work. But I'm speaking generally when it comes to uh, uh, you know, the consensus. So I'm saying I'm the best. I'm the new person in the list. I'm the only one with fresh idea. I'm the only one who hasn't been in office who have something else to offer other than what we've been hearing from these guys, most of which they say one thing and don't do. So I know I'm the best. That's why I'm here. All right. But two, two things, uh, you know, stick out for me in all you've said uh, so far, Dr. Felix. Uh, first for me is, so why the point of, of the screening, especially where you are concerned? I don't know how whether the issue of um, concession came up during uh, your screening. And, of course, the issue of security is understandably a common ground among all uh, that the aspirants, the more than 20 aspirants, you know, have said in their manifesto so far. So, so tell us more about, you know, uh, these idea that you would concede uh, to a consensus candidate if the person's idea of secure, solving the security challenges fits with yours. Yeah, uh, first of all, we haven't been told that this is going to be a consensus. It's just part of what can happen. And during the screening, we were asked, if that happened, are you okay with it? Now, one thing I don't want to do, uh, I believe a united party is uh, a united nation. We're not going to uh, have the party divided over that. So it's not like we are going into consensus or we have been told this is going to be a consensus. As of today, Every one of us, we are preparing our delegates. I'm meeting with many of them. I met with some of the delegates yesterday. So we are prepared for the election. But if at the end of the day, 
uh, that happen, we have to see how it goes. So I know uh, the president made a statement yesterday, but we haven't been told that this is going to be purely consensus. Now, talking about the issue of security, you know, like I said, ma majority of these candidates, uh, of these aspirants, have been in government. Many were governors. While they were governors, uh, uh, security vote was allocated to them. They didn't do anything. They didn't get more vehicles. They didn't improve the lifestyle of the police officers. It's not when they become president they're going to do that. They've had their fair chance. They have the opportunity to at least improve uh, uh, the life of the citizens while they were in power at various levels, whether it be a minister or a senator. But they didn't do it. So uh, it's hard for me to just believe they're going to do it now. So that's why I said, uh, even though you are saying you're going to uh, ensure the nation is safe, I have to be sure that you are going to abide by what you're saying. I am bringing something fresh to the table. Security is one thing Nigeria needs. How do we do this? First of all, let me quickly just throw a few things in. Like I've always said, the UN recommend 450 to uh, a ratio of 450 to 1. Now Nigeria is already falling below that ratio. We cannot, uh, 371,000 police officers in, in, in Nigeria. That's way too small for two, uh, over 206 million people. So the first thing we must do is to hire at least a minimum of one million police officers to join the force so that they'll be able to combat uh, the insecurity in the nation. Like I always say, it's always, I'm always amazed when you move around our cities, you don't see police officers. The only place you see them are on the roadblocks and that will not do us any good. So we need to reform the police system, change their style of policing. And this I know, and some of the things, uh, that's some of the things I'm bringing to the table. I've not heard many of these guys say, say this. They only talk about security, security. They're not giving us details how they're going to do it. What are they going to do differently that has not been done before and yet did not produce these desired results? All right, Dr. Felix, let me uh, take you back a little bit. Uh, the, the president's meeting with, go with the governors where he was talking about them allowing him to pick, pick his successor, you as a as an aspirant, uh, what? Uh, how does that sit with you? Now, as you know, the, some of the, the governors have a say in this. Some of the governors know the delegates. So, if he said that to the governors, uh, he has he has the right to say it, uh, you know. And uh, he's telling them, "Let me do this." They are not running for to become governor of your state; they are running to become the president. I'm the one that is going to hand over. So he since. Uh, we're trying to pick somebody that will take over from me. Why don't I have the right to, to, to choose somebody? I'm sure if the governors uh, in their various states, so they have aspirants, they will want the same to have a say is who, whoever they are going to hand over to. So that statement is good for them, you know, to the governors. But to us as aspirants, I think it will be said differently. Again, we haven't been told. I haven't uh, gotten any message. I've only been asked. If it gets to a consensus, are you okay with it? Will you just break out from the party and cause issue? For me, that's not why I'm here. All right. Now, but the, the point there is, anybody who is contesting to be president, you, you, you will look at the country from a very broad perspective. And if you have the chance or you have the opportunity or you have the support, as the case may be, to be the, the president eventually, of course, you are not going to just be acting within your. You're going to be acting considering all of the interests within the country. Now, considering the standards of democracy, uh, the idea of uh, consensus, where the or where the situation where the president is requesting to pick his own uh, successor, how does that undermine the standards of democracy, where the people are supposed to be the ones deciding who should be the next president? Okay, let's 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 uh, you know really examine this issue of consensus. They haven't said, for example, if any of the aspirants refuse, that the aspirant will be disqualified. I think what this consensus is all about. Uh, we're about twenty-three aspirants right now. They're trying to reduce the number, and whoever is willing, you know, to step down for this, probably it might just be a few of us who head back to the poll on that day and decide. So I haven't heard that if I, for example, refuse consensus automatically I'm disqualified. So if, if, I, if that is not the case, I think uh, there's still room for full democracy to play out here. Now, again, consensus is part of the party uh, 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 constitution. So if that is there already and is approved by INEC, I think it's something that we have to work with. That's where the discussion is going to come in. That's where the conversation, we're going to have to talk and be able to rub minds together. 
you must understand that as a party, we must stand united in order for us to be able to defeat other parties. We must stand united. So if it come to whereby for us as aspirants, some of us need, some others need to give up their personal ambition and all of that, to be able to have a united party so we can defeat our opponent, I think it's worth doing. It's part of democracy, discussing, you know, coming to an agreement and moving forward. Well, um, there is difference between consensus and imposition. You cannot impose a consensus. Why is it that some people are talking about consensus when what the president was talking about was imposition? If you look at the statement very well, and if you look at the people he was talking to, he was speaking to the APC government, of which many of them already have their, prefer they have their preferred candidates, they have their, uh, the people they think they should, uh, that should be elected. So he is telling them, back off, let me do this. They are running to be the president. So I, I see that statement just to the governor. That statement is not to us as aspirants. He hasn't said, this is the person and that's it. I don't believe that if uh, maybe the president come up with somebody and say, this is the person, every other person should not go. That's not democracy. That's not where, where we are at the, at the moment. Uh, the president also has the right to say, this is my preferred candidate. And we also have the right to say, okay, if this is your preferred candidate, we're willing to work with him or, or not. So uh, it's not in position. It's, uh, no candidate will be imposed on anybody. But I think the president has the right to suggest. He's a human being. He, he has his own will. And the statement to the governor, this is to them. And if he said to them, back off, let me do this, I believe he has the right to do so. He's the president. But when he does that, if you know, remember what happened in the case of the uh, party chairmanship uh, contest. Immediately he said, this is my preferred candidate. It became an opposition. Then everybody who was supposed to vote for uh, anybody else decided to, uh, to aid the line of the president. And uh, some of the contestants, I really know some of them, are still bitter up to today. The party said, uh, he said they, they should refund their money, the money they paid. The party has not refunded even the 100 million that uh, they paid now. If the uh, president's wish comes to pass, it will appear as if your party, APC, is doing 419 to his contestants, taking their money and then not uh, doing their own part of the deal. Every party, every organization have internal issues. And if there are internal issues within the party, I think uh, the party uh, working committee will be able to resolve that. The fact that there are little issues here and there does not mean the party should be divided. If the party is divided, we've already failed. So there are so many times we must put our, our personal ambition by the side and be able to work for the nation. It's a lot of sacrifice. We've seen people done that. So uh, the fact that one or two persons may be aggrieved with the way things were done, I believe it's up to the party now to be able to resolve it. It's not an issue that uh, will be flogged nationally. We have a campaign, an election coming for. There are other political parties. We must do everything as a party to be able to unite the party so we can be able to fight and win this next election. Without that, we've already failed. So uh, opposition, we always find the issues within us. So also, if we, if we x-ray every political party out there, I'm sure there are people who also agree with one thing or the other. But as a party, we must stay united, and that's what I'm for. So, but when you look at, you know, the, the formidable, as many have, um, you know, alluded to the emergence of Atiku Abubakar as uh, the flag bearer of the main opposition party, the PDP, uh, how does that picture, you know, come across uh, for you? And where do you think the party, your party, the APC, you know, should look out to present eventually uh, a match, a suitable match for Mr. Atiku Abubakar? Without missing word, I am the suitable match. I'm the only aspirant among the 23 of us who hasn't been in office. I'm the only aspirant who can boldly stand and declare that EFCC can come after me right now, do everything possible, X-ray, in and out, and yet they won't find anything. I'm the only aspirant who can clearly say, I have something new I'm bringing to the table. Many of them have had the opportunity and they don't do it. It's not when they become president they are going to do it. I'm the only aspirant who understands what a system is. I have lived in a system that works. I know a system that works. 
I'm bringing something new to the table. And that's why I'm sure that when we get there that day, I'm going to be the candidate that will be elected. I'm the only one who can match article. I'm the only one who is able to pull even people from PDP and other parties because I'm the only asp young aspirant. Nigerians have been crying for a young person. We cannot elect these old people. It's enough for them to retire. I call them our, respectfully our fathers. We are going to retire them. We need fresh blood. If France, with a $2 trillion economy, can elect a 39-year-old to become president, if America, with a $21 trillion economy, can elect Obama 47 years old, I see no reason why Nigeria, with just $42 billion uh, economy, cannot elect a young person. We are ready, and I'm the only one who I know, if presented before article, Nigerians will receive the shock, and they're going to be afraid. And like I said, when I'm nominated as the candidate, even the chairman of PDP will vote for me because it will be too obvious that I'm the man that Nigeria needs at the moment. Well, with, with all due respect, uh, when Macron was running for France, it was a household name. When Obama was running in the U.S., it was a house, household name. They don't really know who Felix is. How do you, how do you think that uh, you, can, you, you, you can really play out trying to position yourself as a David against Goliath. But even, even David came from a, from a family, from a study family. It was, it was known in Israel. But I don't think anybody knows who you are. How do you think that uh, suddenly people will rally against you? Are you just uh, living in illusion or you are looking to uh, get attention from the big names so that uh, when they win, uh, you two can get into the sweepstakes of office? Uh, that's, not, that's not why I came out. 2019, that's what was told, that nobody knows you. But yet, I came to that position. I go from, uh, uh, my, my campaign is grassroots, unlike some of our, our candidates. Yesterday, for example, I met with candidates from different cities in my hotel. Some of that candidates would take pictures of that and put on social media, and you think they are doing something. I've done work that most of these candidates uh, did not do. So let me correct something. When Obama was coming, Obama was just a fresh blood. It was just, it had just been elected. I didn't even know anybody called Obama until halfway, even though I was living in America. Majority of people did not know Obama. When the media came and brought this young man out, the news spread on an overnight. Obama became a household name. So he was not an household name. He was just elected for the first time into the, into the Senate. So let, let, let's get that very clear. Now, household name without result, is that what we want? Yes, they are household name. They've been in the system for a long time, but they are the one who destroyed the country. So it doesn't matter if they are household name. That, that doesn't mean they are going to produce results. Nigeria knows me. I came third in the last election. I went from city to city. For example, I've been to Nasarawa five times. I've been to, to Benin. I've been to Awuchi. I've been to my village. I've been to Lagos. I've been moving around. I've been reaching out to all the delegates. As of today, my team, we have reached out to at least 1,600 delegates. We've had one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. We're doing work that we're not putting on social media. Some of the delegates I met yesterday, they've heard of, even though I've not met them before now. My team has reached out to them. We've sent messages. We've made calls. We've had dialogue with them. Anyone who wants to speak with me, I've been speaking to them. From Bayesa, from Edo, from Nasarawa, from Zamfara. We've been having conversation with them. So the fact that we don't bring all on, on the table, people think uh, on social media, people think we're not doing the work. So household name does not mean you're going to produce results. If you say you don't know me, now you know me. I'm on, I'm on live on TV with you, you're hearing about me, and that's the shock that is going to, to, to fall upon everyone on that day when I'm nominated to run for office. That's okay. when you uh, know uh, the change has come. We cannot elect the same people who have been in office and we expect change. Where you know change has come to Nigeria, when we elect somebody who hasn't been there before, then Nigeria will be expecting something new. I, admire, I really admire your enthusiasm and your your optimism, but I just a point of correction. Obama immediately announced at your own stage was already catching fire. Right. Um, yes, so, right. so it's a different comparison. And Macron caught fire immediately. You are still trying to stoke the stove. But uh, we, we really feel that uh, uh, your enthusiasm I, is good and I will uh, encourage you to continue. Let me, let me truly show you. You made a statement about David and Gola. As you know, I'm a pastor, so I think I can, I can do a little <laughs> preaching to you. Uh, right now. When David, when the story was heard about David, even his father did not recommend David. When he got to the battlefield, his elder brother said to him, you have come with busy body. You can't do this. You're just a shepherd boy. When David was recommended to Saul, mm -hmm. and Abner asked, uh, David, Saul asked Abner, whose son is this guy? We don't know his father. 
Jesse was not a rich man in the society, but he was the one that was ordained to do it. And guess what? Even when Saul gave him his sword, he said, I'm not used to this. If this sword could not kill Goliath all this way, why do you think if you give it to me, I'm going to do it? So that's the exactly, I, I try not to preach when I'm on the campaign field. So since you have brought David, so let me just quickly throw that in. David okay. did not use the equipment, the weapon, that could not bring Goliath down. He brought a fresh thing. He brought a sneak stone. Even Goliath despised him. That's what's going to happen. When I'm elected, some of these guys will say, nobody knows him. He's not going to win the, on the day of election. <laughs> they will be amazed when I click the gate. 80% of the vote will be for me. That's what's going to happen. That's what Goliath did. He said, who's this little guy? You have not been a man of war. You have not fought any battle. You're coming to me with a small stone. He did not come prepared. That's the shock that we need today in Nigeria. When I'm elected as a candidate, these guys are going to despise me. But when they wake up that day on election month, Nigeria to receive the shock of the century. Yeah, David caught fire because he had God. I'm sure you think you have God in this election. <laughs> I think I have God. I have him, of course. <laughs> All right, Dr. Felix. The, the point there is, the, since independence, the issues that uh, Obafemi Awolowo and uh, Amadou Belu, Namdi Azikiwe and the others, the issues they have used as campaign uh, 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 promises and their manifestos are still the issues we use as campaign promises until today. Issues of housing, roads, electricity, pipeline water, economy, and so on. And in, by 2011, the issue of security became, uh, came to the front burner when it, when it came to a, a presidential aspirant promising I'm going to ensure their security because of our peculiarity. Now, you're coming on board at this time. You've mentioned security. What, what are you going to do? What's that special thing? Because you've talked about you being uh, uh, the, 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 the David, and you're going to make a difference. You're, going to, you're coming up with something fresh. What is that unique thing, different from what everybody has done that is going to endear the Nigerian voters to you? OK. I mentioned security. Mm. Uh, yes, it's one issue that has been before us. In every political race, whether in Nigeria, in, in Europe, or in America, they address the issues that is currently going on in the country. If you go to America, you don't hear much of the security like we, we hear here because this is our major problem. Now, I already said we're going to have to hire one million police officers for a start. We're going to have to have a different style of policing. This hasn't been done. The police force is over 90 years. They have been using the same thing. If it has not produced results, why don't we change it? How about having enough police cars on the street? How about having police officers drive around? If you, if you go and research, you'll notice in the 80s and the early 90s, New York City was plagued with insecurity, crime all over the place. The new mayor, Mayor Giuliani, introduced something, which is something I'm going to introduce. What is it called? They call it stop and fix. It worked so much in New York City, and the city was clean. How do you do that? Our police are trained to respect the citizens. They approach them politely and respectfully, not what we see with the, with the SARS and the rest. We have to you know, train them. They go around the city. They drive. If they see a suspicious vehicle, they stop them, ask questions. Uh, you know, and if need be, they can search. By so doing, in the midst of that, you'll be catching people with weapons. This one that the people get kidnapped, they are transported within our cities. You're going to be catching the, the bad guys with guns and all of that. We're going to introduce that. We have to get more vehicles, get them sophisticated weapons. Number two, we have to start paying our police officers good money. The average police officer earns 42000 in a month. You cannot send people to put their life on the line and you give them such chicken chain. We have to ensure their lives. Any police officer who dies in the line of duty, a government official, is that the local government chairman or the governor, must be in that area. They have to have insurance. We have to empower them to go and do their job passionately. These are some of the things I'm bringing, bringing on board. Now, again, I, I brought a proposal that, that I think is going to help the economy. Let me just be through this in. I know we're talking about uh, security. I, when I become president, I'm going to give a 12-month pattern. I'm sure you have heard me say this. If you hear somebody else say it from today, you know they got it from me. I'm going to give a 12-month pattern, and I'm going to tell all our politicians, all our businessmen, it doesn't matter who you are, bring your money that you have abroad back to the economy. We're not going to ask you how you got it, when you got it. Just declare and bring the money back. I'm going to set up a committee. All you're going to do, you're going to pay between 10 and 25%, depending on the amount and the rate you fall into. You're going to pay the tax into the tre uh, federal government account, and the money will be brought back to the economy so that we can have investment. 
We encourage them to go and plant factories, build factories. We encourage the banks to be able to ease the collateral they ask for people and be able to give loan back. When we do this, you will be amazed what that will do to our economy. And the next question will be, how will that work? President Trump did the same thing in 2017. You know, uh, Americans uh, have a lot of companies abroad in China. Anytime you're about to bring your money back, there's a high rate of tax. When Trump came, he lowered the, 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 the rate of tax. In one year, in less than 12 months, $1 trillion came back to the economy. This we must do. A lot okay. of our money are abroad. 2016, when the president introduced whistleblowing, you are amazed money of this money started coming out. Let me quickly say this. Isn't it surprising that the only person we are recovering his money is Abacha? Abacha is the only president we have been recovering money for the past years. And surprisingly, Abacha was president from 1993 to 1998, five years. A, a gallon of oil was, uh, was 11 naira. Abacha is the only president that never increased the price of oil. And yet, he's the only man we have been recovering his money because the man is dead. He's not alive. If he was alive, there would be no money recovered from Abacha. So which tells me we still have billions of our money offshore. We need to bring that back to the economy so the economy can thrive. This is one thing I'm going to do. I'm going to give a 12-month pattern. In other words, within the next 12 months, bring all your money back to the economy. We're not going to penalize you. We we'll sign it. Sign it. I'm all sure right. our senators will agree. I'm sure they will not oppose it because okay. they'll be one of the people that will benefit from it. All right, Doctor uh, Nicholas Felix. Uh, Felix, I, I, I just wish we had a lot of more time to talk about all of these because uh, there are so many aspects to this. But we thank you very much for your doggedness and your readiness and your fire and drive to uh, push through through the election. I will wish you well. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Great.